Hello, everybody. Welcome to finals week here. Um, you should be getting ready to uh, complete this class here. We're going to begin the week on Monday, August 1st. The class will be done um, on Friday. So take special note to that end date. You know, prior to now, the completion of our, our course. Uh, weeks has been on Sunday night by 11.59 p.m. on Sunday night. However, this week, uh, the class is over and absolutely no assignments will be accepted or, or uh, you know, any kind of late, uh, you know, make up stuff prior to 11.59 p.m. on Friday. So with that being said, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can do week one stuff now just just because you didn't get around to it but it's to uh it's to suggest that if you know you have a computer issue or you know something uh falls through on you uh, especially for this week at the very least i would hope that i can get an email or something just let me know hey i'm having problems but the truth is you will have uh three days to do your final which is plenty of time um and there's no assignment due this week. So you should have no issues uh, completing whatever you need to complete by Friday at uh, 11.59 p.m. Friday. So basically, once it turns into Saturday, everything is done, everything is graded, and everything is going to be submitted. So again, uh, I'm usually not too much of a stickler with stuff, but it gets pretty crazy if... Uh, if I have to try to play catch up with, you know, six weeks of work and, and uh, only have a day or two to do it. So just make sure everything is good to go. I know that that won't be an issue. With that being said, uh, I do want to go over. So obviously with every week we have uh, an announcement. This week is no different. I just wanted to let you all know. Um, congratulations to you all for making it this far. Um, we covered a lot of stuff. We covered a ton of, of stuff here. Um, I tried not to beat you to death here with uh, with some of these lectures to where uh, it's just me droning on and on and on. You know, look, it's an online class, and, uh, you know, we were expected to cover a lot of material. And, and really, I mean, six short weeks, but even our, our last week here has been abbreviated a bit. So, you know, you, you've all covered a ton of information quickly. Um with most of my classes, you know, I kind of preach that I would rather you understand the material. Um, it's an important, being able to answer certain questions is absolutely an important side of online or, or any kind of academic course. Um, we need to be able to test you and understand what you learned from the class, what what you know now that you maybe you didn't know prior to the class. And uh, it's important that we do that. Oftentimes that is through tests, final exams, things like that quizzes. But again, with this class, we did a lot of conceptualization, I guess. Uh, we did a lot of um, testing your understanding and how you can explain to me. You're almost teaching me in some of these uh, uh, coursework assignments. I'd ask you to explain to me or, or, or how would you do this incorporating principles that we learned from class. This is all very... Uh, very intended or very intentional because uh, I've always stuck to my teaching philosophy that is I want you to understand the material eventually this is all a part of a process that's going to put you all out there if you aren't already so it's going to put you out there in positions where you do have to solve some of these problems and I hope that you can draw on some of the material that you learned from this class to do just that um, even if it's just, uh, hey, I remember that Joker, uh, Jake Morris, talking about this, that, or the other. Um, let me look that up and find out what the heck he was talking about because I kind of need that right now. If that's all you get out of this, that's awesome because it will give you, uh, it'll give you a kind of a tool in your toolbox to be able to handle some of the things that you may encounter in the real world. Um, so with that being said, guys, thank you so much. It's been an awesome, awesome six weeks. It's it's always a challenge being in an online class here because. I don't get an opportunity to really truly form meaningful relationships with you. We've this this uh, semester 
I tried to have a few Zoom meetings and things like that. And look, man, I was a student. I still am a student. And uh, yeah, there's better places that I think you guys all want to be than uh, than FaceTime and old Jake Morris here. So I totally understand it. No, uh, no offense uh, taken. But with that being said, you know, I tried to uh, at least make myself accessible for you guys. And a few of you have reached out. Um, some of you haven't. And, and that's OK, too. You all seem to be doing really well in the course and and i'm really pleased with your with your your scores on a lot of these assignments and in the feedback so just a great job keep up the great work man i really hope that the the feedback that i gave to all of you helps you succeed not only in this class but obviously in other classes there were some things that i wouldn't necessarily ding anybody on points for but i still felt that it was important to let you know because hopefully it will make you a better student. It will make it will make your academic journey much smoother to know how uh, maybe an instructor grades or or what we look for in certain assignments. So please, uh, you know, anything, everything that we do here is intended to to make you better. Certainly, I feel like I've got I've gotten better just by uh, being a part of your academic journey. So again, thank you all so much. If there's ever anything I can do, by all means, make sure you knock out those course evaluations too. I actually take those pretty serious. The Zoom meeting ideas um, was actually a suggestion from one of my last course uh, evaluations. And yeah, I mean, it, I know, I don't think anybody actually showed up to any of them, but the idea is it's important that they're available if you need them. And uh, that's that's the intention behind it. So. Again, thank you guys so much. Be sure to knock out those course evals because I do read them and I, I honestly take uh, even the constructive criticism. Um, hey, hopefully I can be a great teacher for somebody in the future, maybe some of your kids. <laughs> anyway, let's get to the, to the nitty gritty here. This is our last uh, online lecture. Um, our to-do list this week, we're going to go over chapter 10. This, chapter 10 is the only thing we're going to be looking at. We have a shorter week and some of that week is going to be filled in by our final exam, so we're not going to we're not going to nail you with too much because here's the deal. I think there's 16 chapters in our book. We're not going to get through all 16 chapters. To do so would again be like drinking from a fire hose, and that's just not really conducive to learning. Um, let's just focus on quality and let's get chapter 10 here, and uh, we're going to go over that today. Uh, again, the highlights. I'm not going to read you the book. I'm not going to go too, too deep in it, but we're going to create at least an understanding or a base so that when you read or if you read, um, this can supplement that uh, that learning. <clears throat> this is the online video, so you're doing that already. Uh, you're doing that right now. Final exam will be available from Tuesday, 8:22, excuse me, 8:22 at noon until. 11.59 p.m. Friday, okay? Friday, it shuts down as does every other everything. What can you do to be successful at your final? There's going to be a, uh, there's going to be a read this before you take the final uh, section, like a little to-do list for your final specifically. Here's the deal. Study your quizzes. Study your quizzes and understand some of these major theories that we spoke about in our assignments. This is a culmination of everything that we've learned. Therefore, it only makes sense that we're going to be drawing from course material. Now, I will incorporate some Chapter 10 stuff, okay? So we're not going to have a Chapter 10 quiz because I'm not going to give you a quiz and then give you a final over that same stuff. That would just be bonkers. But with that being said, um, I am going to... Um, have a few questions from chapter 10 so please do read chapter 10 and uh and you know don't shortcut it now right you're you're right at the finish line let's uh let's sprint through that finish line instead of uh limping limping through it uh and if there's anything i can do in the future for you guys by by all means again reach out email um and uh yeah hopefully uh best of luck to you guys in the future let's get started with our uh with our video lecture here so peers, gangs, and youth crime is chapter 10. Um, there is a lot of, you know, we, we spoke about this last time, the social connections um, and how 
sometimes a relationship with somebody's family or a coach or a mentor can can cause them to not want to disappoint, right? The social bonding theory and, and it's important that uh, you understand how peers affect crime. So, you know, here's here's a little tip of the pros chapter outlines. This is going to tell you what they're talking about. Sometimes when you know what they're trying to explain to you, it makes the actual explanation easier to digest. So um, this chapter is going to outline a couple of facts and figures, blah, blah, blah. But really, it's peers and youth crime. They're going to explain the influence of delinquent peers, methodological considerations, and peer strategies. As far as gangs go, understanding gangs and gang membership, gang suppression strategy, uh, beyond gang suppression, addressing community community conditions. So these are, uh, then it's going to conclude, which so will our class. But uh, again, these are the types of things that when you guys are, are looking at these, uh, this is the last really big thing that I think from a crime prevention standpoint, look, we can go all the way through to chapter 16. We're not going to be able to because we just don't have the time. But the idea is... Uh, this was an important, important chapter, and I think it's a great one to end on. Gangs in crime and youth and peers. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you set a trajectory. When you when you start to deviate, okay, and, and, and be, you know, even, even dip your toe into, like, criminal waters, right, to, to, to use, like, the euphemism here, when you begin committing crimes, even low-level crimes at a young age, it tends to set a trajectory where you can end up doing really, really bad things at an older age, okay? So again, it's trying to shift that uh, trajectory back towards the norm. And this is how we prevent crime. This, this is a crime prevention strategy. When we see that there are youth gangs that are doing things like stealing from grocery stores or, or something like that, we, we try to curb that, we try to um, stop them, either, either membership in those gangs or deter the actual crime of the gang themselves because of the implications it's going to have way, way down the road for criminality for all of the members of that gang. So typically, you know, research would find that people don't usually start off, uh, you know, sh murdering people, okay? However... It tends to be more of a progressive thing where, yeah, you start off, uh, you know, whatever, smoking weed, uh, maybe spray painting buildings, stealing from stores or stealing from houses. And then the next thing you know, you're a gang leader, um, you know, way, way years down the road. And, and maybe you're, you're one of the serious actors in that gang. You're, you're doing drive-bys, you're shooting people or selling high amounts of drugs, all, all that kind of stuff. So, uh this is an important idea here. <clears throat> to reduce crime, it is essential to reduce youth crime. Um, deadly and serious alike. So adolescents and, and young adults commit more than their fair share of crime. Um, and as we just spoke about, drive-by shootings, okay? Um, the most serious juvenile offenders continue to commit crime well into, the, into young adulthood. The most serious juvenile offenders really commit crime well well into adulthood and then it kind of usually starts to taper off if they live past a certain age you know but again if you're going down that road there's typically only one or two ways that that ends and that's either with prison or uh you know six feet under so these are the kinds of things that uh we we realize that getting someone out of that that criminal deviant mindset early can can really really help you stop closing doors you're not getting arrested you're not a convicted felon trying to find a job now you're if we can stop that from happening then you, you typically don't have many of these obstacles that are in place stopping you from being legitimate or or you know not committing crimes so um again a good chapter here as you start to read um this is kind of more of the introduction. This is the overall. They're going to talk more about this stuff later in the chapter, so we're not going to go through this page right here. Um, again, you read it, but for us, we're going to kind of breeze through this a little bit. Uh, youth crime facts and figures. 
So peers, peer risk intervention. Um, there's a difference between peers and gangs. In a sense, gangs can be your peers. However, there are older gang members and younger gang members, whereas your peers are typically people right around your same age and, uh, and, and not somebody that you look up to, but somebody that you kind of hang out with. So you're not hanging out with the gang leader. You might aspire to be the gang leader, but you and your buddies are all in the same boat. You all aspire to be a senior gang member or something like that. So that's the difference, I guess, between those two groups. Um, these are some of the strategies that they have to deal with each of those. So like peer deviance, you know, you and your buddies are deciding you want to go steal, you know, bikes from Walmart. Um, Gangs are, you and your buddies are stealing bikes from Walmart to give to gang members so that they can sell drugs. You're, you're kind of more of an organizational actor. You know, you play a role in that organization. Whereas with your peers, you're, you're almost kind of doing it for the adrenaline rush. And, uh, and, and because your, your buddy's doing it, you don't want to be the uncool uh, person. So teen courts, we're going to talk more about these. Peer risk intervention, teen courts, youth employment programs, and mentoring. These are great for addressing peer crime, you know, young people crime. They're typically talking here adolescents, meaning about 12 to 17, okay? Um, as far as gangs go, to stop the, the, the damaging effects of gangs, I, I guess, they have gang suppressions, uh, programs, uh, group violence intervention, functional family therapy, and gang resistance education and training, or as we call it, GREAT. Um, that's kind of the new D.A.R.E. D.A.R.E. has fallen off somewhat. It's still around, but it's not the same that it was when I was a kid. But this one right here, GREAT training, it's 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 really kind of under the same umbrella, and uh, and it is something that we use today. Um, here's some kind of quick facts. I'm not going to hit you with those, but they're interesting. Uh, check them out. Um, but here we go. Peers and youth crime. Look, ultimately, guys, it's peers and gangs that we're going to be talking about in this chapter, okay? So I'm not, again, I'm not going to build the house. I'm just going to tell you what it looks like so that you can build the house yourself. Uh, but here's the peers and youth crime. So again, this is the introduction to, to this major, major section that's going to talk about peers. Okay. Um, explaining the different, the influence of delinquent peers. That's pretty huge. Um, what you're going to see early on is that the social side of delinquent behavior here, which, which criminologists, criminologists have long recognized, um, they basically said that if you have friends who are doing things illegal, you're more likely to do those things as well. When young people break the law, they usually do so in the company of others their age. So even if you're not uh, the kid that was, let's just say smoking marijuana, right? I, you know, it is technically still illegal here in Ohio, uh, at least today. Um, if you're the kid that really doesn't smoke marijuana, but all of your friends do, yeah, you can cling to that identity as the kid who doesn't smoke marijuana, okay? You're, I, I hang out with those guys, but I'm just the one that doesn't do that. Well, that's great. Um, but the idea is, is that statistically you're more prone to do that. You're going to have a moment of weakness, whether it's peer pressure or just because you got caught in a moment where you were curious and you did some things. Now, on another side of the coin, if, uh, if you're hanging out with people who don't do that, it's much, much easier to not end up experimenting with marijuana or, or, or doing that. You know, again, it's breaking the law on a very technical aspect. Um, for all of you that are out there listening to this lecture now, don't smoke marijuana because someday you're going to have to take a lie detector test or uh, a job interview that asks how much you smoke marijuana. And you know, although it is not necessarily homicide, you know, it's not the crime of the century, it is still something that if, if you're 
training to become a police officer. If you're serious about becoming a police officer, um, I know of a lot of police agencies that will have a hard time hiring you if you say, well, yeah, I smoked marijuana six months ago. They're going to say, well, then how really, you know, how serious are you about becoming a police officer? So keep that in mind. You know, you don't want to ever close any doors. We're getting a little bit off the rails here. But, uh, but again, hopefully that gives you a little something. Back to the actual delinquent groups here. Don't hang around people that smoke marijuana. You're probably not going to. If you do hang around with people that smoke marijuana, you are at a higher risk. It doesn't mean you're 100% going to do it, but you're at a higher risk. And that's true for a lot of different things. Group fights, gang fights, uh, thefts, shoplifting, all, here, burglary, trespassing, vandalism property crime, um, marijuana use. Look at that. We just spoke of that. Um, and underage drinking. All of those things are, are things that uh, when they're done in groups, members of that group are at a much, much higher risk of also participating in that type of behavior. So that's really, I'm not going to beat this thing into the ground, but that's what the peers thing is. It's the habits that your friends keep, I don't know what the saying is that, you know, my mom and maybe your, some of your moms and dads have said before, but uh, it's something about the company that you keep, right? You know, if you may or may not be somebody that commits crimes, but if you hang out with a bunch of people who commit crimes, guess what? That's probably how you're going to be identified. And the reason why is because it makes sense that you would doesn't mean that you do. It just means that it makes sense that you would. And this is kind of saying that in, in a roundabout sort of way. If you hang out in groups that do certain things, if you hang out in groups that work out with weights all the time, you're probably going to be in better shape than someone that hangs out in groups that eat pizza all the time. I would love to hang out with a pizza eating group. <laughs> but, uh, but with that being said, uh, you're, you don't have to be the best in your group at anything. You're just probably going to be into that. Because why else would you hang out with them, right? So it's uh, it's pretty logical. Um, here's, here they're going to explain why there's influence by the delinquent peers. So why would somebody who's not quote unquote a criminal, we're not trying to label anybody here, but why would somebody who's a good boy or a good girl end up breaking the law because they're hanging out with uh, delinquent peers. Well, our friend here, Mr. Edwin Sutherland, if you remember him from the last, well, say, Differential Association, Chapter 8, um, he posits, or his position, is that adolescents may commit delinquency because they learn and adopt the beliefs and attitudes of delinquent friends that justify breaking the law. So again, if your buddy says, Hey, relax, dude. It's just weed. You know, it's not that big of a deal. It comes from the earth. You know, these attitudes, these ideas, these values, others will tend to adopt. Um, and it just is what it is. Adolescents happen to be a very impressionable group. So adolescents are more prone to, uh, I guess, be susceptible to that sort of thinking. Human beings, for that matter, are susceptible to what's called group think. If you've ever taken a psychology class or sociology class, um, group think is a phenomenon that's pretty fascinating. There's some goofy, goofy uh, experiments that have been done where people say some off the wall crap and uh, everybody in a room is a part of this experiment, uh, experiment and they say something completely off the wall, like, you know, I don't know, fill in the blanks. But uh, they say something that is clearly untrue, but everybody raises their hand in the room saying that it is true. So the one person who is not part of that experiment is looking around, seeing everyone else raise their hand to something they know is not true. And they raise their hand saying that it's true as well, because they don't want to be the only one, even though it's quite obviously not true. So. It's fascinating. Group think. Adolescents who are even more impressionable and more susceptible to that um, can tend to be along those same, uh, they can fall victim to that, but, you know, even in much more dangerous ways. 
So it's just heroin. It's just a pill. It's just a pain pill. You know, these are things that can lead to addiction way down the road and can honestly lead to them doing some really, really uh, criminal things to support an addiction, all because they were hanging out with a bunch of people that said it's not that big of a deal or this is actually really, really cool. And they were susceptible. They fell victim to it. And here we are. So again, the influence of delinquent peers. Read this section for sure um, because it is very good. And moving forward, it'll explain a lot of things in your other classes. Um, <clears throat> methodological considerations. This basically says that it will basically this is attacking how they came up with these things. OK, the methodological considerations are, well, what do you consider crime? What do you consider? I think we spoke about spuriousness. Uh, and, you know, the idea is there may be a reason why that is not because you have delinquent friends. Uh, there may be a statistical association, but only because of a third factor, like poverty, right? So if you if you live in a poor neighborhood and you have poor friends, well, then you're all kind of from the same socioeconomic background, right? If uh, If in the neighborhood where people don't have a lot of money, they tend to use drugs. Well, then you're going to use drugs, not because your friends are using drugs, but because you're from this neighborhood. So when we talk about the method methodology, that's what we're talking about. Like, yeah, again, we go back to the ice cream and murder rates. Ice cream sales don't cause murders. Hot weather has been known, warm weather has been known to uh, increase the amount of murders because people are hanging out, they're outside, they're publicly drinking, uh, they're in the streets. So just because hot weather's also been known to drive up ice cream sales. Ice cream sales does not cause murders. Hot weather has been found to cause murders. That's that third dynamic there, that third variable, okay? That third factor. And in this, you know, the same argument is it may not be because their friends are doing drugs or breaking the law. It may be because they're all from the same socioeconomic background. And if you're, you know, from a, a, an economically distressed area, you may be more prone to commit crimes because of that, not because of who your friends are. So there is a couple good arguments against it, although I would still suggest it's probably a culmination of everything. It's probably a little more of everything all being present at once so peer strategies so how do we combat this right well there are numerous uh, peer intervention programs that we're going to be talking about here but i'm going to tell you this read these there's you just kind of have to read them um, I'll, I'll go into some of them but I'm not going to go into all of them because some of them are not necessarily, some of them are pretty self-explanatory and I don't want to lose you. So if I haven't already, anyway, peer risk intervention programs, these are big. They basically intervene, right? Intervention. They're going to intervene when you're an at risk youth. So, uh, basically these programs take many forms. It's more of like an umbrella. It's not necessarily a specific program itself. It's a multitude of different programs that, uh, you know, they're found in many types of settings. Uh, basically, they're, the intention is right here. Uh, as we talk, going back to our buddy Sol uh, Sullivan here. It's designed to resist developing attachments to undesirable peers, right? So if you think about an after-school program where, like, say, ROTC or um, sports, basketball, football, right, soccer, volleyball, um, these are all things that are meant to have you around structure, around coaches, around other people who are focused on getting in shape so that they can win a game, right, an athletic game. 
Uh, same thing with band. Um, not, not as far as the getting in shape part, but um, more about, you know, constructively striving to be the best at something. And, and your focus is on that, and you're around like-minded people who are also focused on being the best tuba player, the best trumpet player, the best drum major. Uh, so the idea, again, is, uh, you know, risk intervention programs are trying to either eliminate or prevent uh, an attachment to undesirable peers, uh, gang members, people that are hanging out on the street corner all night, uh, those types of things. <clears throat> <clears throat> substance abuse is is one of the attacking points here um, some of them are geared towards saying hey if you have a drug problem um, we're gonna or if we see that there's a huge drug problem in this high school then we're gonna implement more things that are geared towards uh, steering people away from uh, substance abuse or offering help for it if they do see it if there's a family history things like that a lot of them are based in high schools why because that's where everything happens when you're a, an adolescent when you're 12 to 18 years old school is your social life you typically don't have a job I mean you can when you're 16 but even when you have a job you're usually not pounding out 40 hours a week um, school will typically be your number one priority and everyone that's at school you can watch any movie you know, listen to, to music, you know, watch any TV show. If the TV show is about a kid that's 16, 15 years old, 17 years old, high school is a major part of that show. Why? Because high school is a major part of your life. So um, the programs are based in high schools and high crime in urban areas. Um, youth, middle schools. There are actually some where this book doesn't go too deep into this, but there are actually some, like, for example, in my own city here, um, we're going to begin doing youth programs even prior to middle school. So I don't know, you, you may come from a different area where middle school is considered something else, but we're talking like fourth, fifth, and sixth graders starting programming. And it's not you know, anything that's like super intense, but it's meant to get them to understand that, hey, there are resources. If I hit a rut, you know, a lot of it has to do with bullying. Um, as you can all imagine, that's a pretty big deal right now. Um, but, you know, it's meant to help kids understand that there are resources. If you're feeling like you're being bullied, there are ways to handle it appropriately. Uh, coping mechanisms, there are healthy outlets, there are sports programs, there's, heck, there's computer video game programming classes that some of these kids are taking now in seventh grade. So again, all of this stuff is meant to provide, uh, I guess, a divergence uh, from criminal behavior. And the attacking point here is we're going to try to stop you from normalizing crime and, and large groups of peers from normalizing criminal behavior. So it's, it's an interesting one. Um, are they effective? Uh, the studies are kind of mixed because the, the results are so, or excuse me, the programs are so diverse, right? You can have a drug prevention program that focuses on art. You can have a drug prevention program that focuses on how to say no when your peers are doing drugs and they offer you some. But they're both substance abuse programs and they're peer risk intervention programs. So, you know, all of these things are, it, it's difficult because these programs may be apples to oranges. You know, you may be comparing two different things. So, yeah, of course, one of them is going to be more effective than the other. One of them is not going to be effective at all. Who knows? And that makes when you you can't really throw away the whole categorization of a peer risk intervention program because a few of them are not successful. You just try a different approach under that umbrella of peer risk intervention programs. So 
Um, like I said, there's there's stuff that suggests both ways uh, that, that they are and they are not successful. Teen Quartz is a pretty interesting one. Teen Quartz basically has the kids act as judge, jury, and executioner in, in one sense. Uh, nobody's getting executed in these courts, luckily. Um, but they, uh, they, because the idea behind these teen courts is that because high school is, is almost like a city in itself, you know, if you think about high school, you have the mayor who is, who's that popular kid, right? Guy, girl, it doesn't matter. But you have certain people that, oh, and that's the most popular girl in school. That's the most popular guy in school. Um, you have people who are naturally almost, almost like your police officers. Now, I'm not saying that they're armed and, and, and trained to uphold the law, but the idea behind this is that they uphold the law of the school, right? They're, they do have a focus on fairness or on just, uh, on justice. If you think about it, when a, a teenager sees somebody being bullied, they may actually, there are kids out there that'll step in and say, hey, that ain't cool, man. You know, stop doing that. Uh, they're essentially acting like the peacekeepers, right? Um, so again, you know, as you, as you consider this and as you, you view it through that scope or through that lens, you'll see that High school is almost like a small city with people who are actors. Some of them are criminals, right? Um, and because of that, they, they empower the teens to have their own court. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty interesting. I mean, the legitimacy, right? The, the buy-in comes from the actual students. So, and that's who you're trying to get through to anyway. So, you know, why wouldn't it work? So there are a little bit of a variation between the different uh, team courts, all right? There's not like one program that says this is team court, but um, the, there's a section in here. Uh, some of them have a team judge, jurors who hear the evidence, prosecutors, defense attorneys, bailiffs. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it can get pretty intense and it's actually pretty fascinating too. So, uh, I'll let you guys read up on that, but that's pretty much what those are. The effectiveness of them, again, it's not going to be 100% here or there. Um, but, but what you do have to worry about is, even though this may be a microcosm of society, meaning like this may be society on a smaller scale when we look at a high school, it's still important to remember that it's not society. So you don't have groups of adults who are raising kids and you know trying to get their degree while they're working 40 hours and they're doing this and that and taking a kid to soccer practice whatever um so because of that you know you can't make this exactly like the actual court but not only that you also don't have judges who have you know worked as attorneys for years been through law school you're you got to understand that you know you are dealing with kids and it's important to understand that kids can make mistakes. So there's some methodological issues that should be discussed. And again, this is going to kind of go through all of that. It's going to tell you that basically um, it's you can't put 100% of your stock into this and say, yep, we don't need to be a part of this anymore. They'll take care of themselves. That cannot happen. Kids do not think about justice the same way as adults do. And it's certainly not as adults who have worked in the justice system and who uh, have been through law school. So there's some checks and balances that are pretty important here. Youth employment programs, that's one of those that I was telling you about. It's just like it sounds. It's getting kids jobs so that they're not sitting around wondering what they're going to do. Um, hey, you get off of school, you go to work. Boom. And then you're too tired to screw up and do the foolish things that Jake Morris did when he was a kid. Um, not that I did anything crazy, but yeah, we'll leave that there. Anyway, those have mixed reviews, although um, they're not, these are pretty, 
if a kid sticks with the program, there's they're pretty promising results. Uh, but there's some other issues that they'll let you read about, like, you know, if you, if you tell a kid, hey, become a busboy, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You know, cleaning off tables at a restaurant. But you're not exactly setting your sights super high. And eventually, when you become 30 or 40, you're not going to want to do that. You know, you're going to want more out of life and you're going to wish that you maybe went to college or maybe worked a little harder, and became a manager or whatever the case may be. Um, so you don't want to oversell the entry level position here and say, oh, everything's done. You've made it because there's still some more to go. Right. You want to you want to, you know, reach for the stars. OK, and then. Then you have your mentoring. Mentoring is, again, exactly what it sounds like. Big brothers, big sisters, great program. Boys and Girls Club, great program. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton. There's a ton of mentoring programs. We'll be here all day if I started going through them. But, you know, this is almost uh, getting into that social bond theory where if you have a mentor, you don't want to disappoint them. That mentor can be a coach. That mentor could be a mom or dad. That mentor could be a teacher. Uh, a police officer, a probation officer, but you don't want to disappoint your mentor. In these mentoring programs, though, they're trying to actually introduce somebody into the lives of a of a of a youth of a of an adolescent, and they're trying to institute some sort of structure, show them, hey, keep your head out of that weed smoke, and uh, instead, you know, hang out with me. And I'm going to show you that if you work hard, if you go to Bowling Green State University and get your degree, you will be super successful. And this is what success looks like. And it's nice, you know, because you have somebody that you can rely on. And, hey, how do I address this? How do I say no to this? How do I avoid doing what my friends are doing? And hopefully, if you have a good mentor, they can they can help with that. These are successful as long as the program itself is legitimate as long as it does what it's supposed to do then they're very successful with but you can have problems if you introduce a mentor that's not a very good mentor then your program's not going to be very successful so very very interesting here um let's get into gangs and crime our next and last section of our class so gangs and crime street gangs okay they're also called youth gangs, juvenile gangs. Um, I'm not going to tell you guys what a gang is. That's kind of insulting. Although, read into some of what they're they're talking about, okay? Because they're setting the table here for us to uh, to really dive into what the problem is. So, give yourself the background. But for for what it's worth, we're just going to go. Okay, gangs are bad, and. Uh, <laughs> We're going to try to understand gangs and gang membership. That's where we get a little more into the into the uh, meat and potatoes here. Now, different different agencies will have different definitions of what a gang is. In Ohio, um, I believe it's I believe it's four or more. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me let's do this here real quick. ORC participating in a criminal gang. I put this case on a bunch of people, so I should know about this, but for whatever the point is, okay. Let's see here. No person who actively participates in a criminal gang. Ah, oh, I've got it. Let's do this. ORC. This is, ORC is the Ohio Revised Code. Okay. Um, that's basically the law in Ohio. Alrighty. Criminal gang definition. What is a criminal gang? It is an ongoing formal or informal organization of three or more, so I was wrong, three or more, and all of the following have to apply. Blah, 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 blah. You can pause now and read this if you'd like. Um, but all you have to do is look up ORC section 23, 2923.41, and it will tell you all of this stuff about what Ohio considers a gang. The reason why we did that is not because we want to necessarily know what Ohio considers a gang, but it's because Ohio's definition of a criminal gang is something different from Illinois. 
uh, or New York or Pennsylvania, um, we're the United States of America, meaning that we're a bunch of different states with a bunch of different governments and a bunch of different laws. Marijuana is legal uh, in uh, Colorado. It's not legal here unless you have a card and, you know, whatever, medical marijuana. So back to the gang thing. Um, this is straight from the National Gang Center. So that is at least one collective organization. Um, and basically, this is what a gang is. Three or more people, usually between 12 and 24. You, you start to age out of the crime window. You know, you're most active at about the age of 24, or just around the age of 24, 21 to 24, 18 to 24. Can't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere around there. After 24, 25, you actually start to drift away from criminality. You're either older or wiser, or you don't want to go back to the penitentiary. So you do what you do. Um, but regardless, that's why there's they're typically between 12 and 24. Um, let's see here. They share an identity, typically linked to a name and often symbols. Um, they're recognized by others as a gang. That's kind of an important part, right? We had in Ohio here, or I'm sorry, in my city, I got hired in 2004. In the 90s, like 91, 92, the Bloods and the Crips were, were, were you know, the names and, and street gangs had had legit names like that, you know, the Bloods, the Crips, the Folk, the Insanes, the Unknowns, the all kinds of old man stuff now, right? But nowadays they're not. There we we just looked up that Ohio Revised Code law. It's actually a crime to be a member of a gang. So they started or they stopped calling themselves Bloods and Crips. They're still Bloods and Crips today, here. But they don't call themselves that. Instead, sometimes they'll, especially locally, they will uh, use hand signs, but they'll call themselves 21st and Broadway. And you're like, well, that's a street intersection, right? Well, yeah, but, but that's their gang name. And when police try to combat that, they say, oh, no, 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 we're, we're cousins. Or we just hang out at 21st and Broadway. That's, we're not a gang, though. Well, you're shooting people, you're selling drugs, you all dress in the color red, and you have a hand sign that you all use when you take your social media pictures. You're a gang, according to the Ohio Revised Code, okay? And, uh, you know, those are the things that we have to overcome as investigators. <clears throat> but with that being said, one of the biggest things is, are they recognized by others as a gang? So, yeah. If, if you're the jump out boys or whatever you want to call yourselves, when other people say, you better watch out for those jump out boys, they'll walk down the street and if they see you, they're going to beat the crap out of you just because that's what they do. Then people recognize you as a gang. And that's one of the, uh, that's often one of the things that we use to say, hey, we might have a gang. Why? Because they're recognized as a gang. And typically that's very purposeful. Um. So this one here, the group has some permanence and degree of organization. I don't know about that. I mean, the only organization I think that you need to have in a gang is there are members and there are non-members. Shy of that? Uh, yeah, I don't think you need, well, this guy's the president, this guy's the vice president, this guy's the secretary and sergeant at arms. Some of them really do have that level of organization. That's great because it makes it easy to put a case on them. But the truth is, yeah, you don't need that deep of an organizational level. You just need, yep, we're members, they're not. Um, and they're involved in an elevated level of criminal activity. Don't have to be elevated. Nope. That's not. They just have to be involved in criminal activity in order to be considered a criminal gang. Okay. So you can sell marijuana all day. If that's what that gang does, then that's a criminal gang. Now, are we going to put forth all the resources to bust a criminal gang that's selling some dime bags? I don't know. Depends on where you work. 
But what I'm telling you is that they are still a criminal gang if they're committing criminal activity. It doesn't have to be elevated because that's a very relative term. Okay, 30,000 gangs, 30% 30 law enforcement jurisdictions all across the nation. So there's a ton of gangs, okay? There's a ton of gang members. And they're found all over the place. Great. What are the strategies that we use to suppress them? Well, primary gang prevention, okay? Reduce poverty. So basically reduce where the grounds where gangs thrive. You know, they, they have this stat here of 30,000 gangs all over the place in suburban counties. 50% of suburban counties have one. Well, some of those are just emulating things that they see in like Los Angeles and New York City, Chicago, uh, Miami. S some of them are legit, the gangs. I argue that it doesn't matter whether you're emulating, whether you're a wannabe or not. If you've got a gun in your waistband and you're shooting people, throwing up a gang sign, you're dangerous. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter whether you're a, somebody that's kind of posing or, or biting off or whatever. You're dangerous if if you're doing dangerous things, regardless of why you're doing them. Um, so primary, secondary, tertiary. Uh, this one focuses on the factors, right? So when we talk about crime prevention, we're looking at what causes crime. What, well, in this, they're looking at what causes gangs. So let's reduce poverty. Let's get better school. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, these are some of the things that, that allow, or, or these are, let's attack the atmosphere that's inviting for gang formation. Um, but secondary, these are focusing on the individuals, okay? So what, what would make a kid want to join a gang? What puts them at risk? And let's go after those things. And then tertiary, um, once they're already in gangs, let's try to get them out, right? Let's try to divert them from participation and, and, and really truly having a deep connection with them, with the gangs. Um, the effectiveness of gang suppression differs by the area, right? So I would, I would argue that, uh, you know, the south side of Chicago, they're not having a whole lot of effectiveness in gang suppression. Um, but you know what? Maybe they are. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I haven't read some of the research. Although, south side of Chicago, pretty well known for pretty bloody crimes. Detroit, same idea, you know, a little closer to home. Um, maybe they're making progress, but they're certainly not uh, Beverly Hills, right? Um, civil gang injunctions. We tried to do that. It's tough to make it work, but basically it, it makes it a crime for two convicted gang members to be able to hang out with each other. It's almost like you get a, uh, you know, a protection order or a restraining order on two people from being allowed to hang out with each other, even though neither of the two want it. If you find two guys walking together that are both convicted gang members and they've been served with this civil gang injunction, you can arrest them. The problem is, what happens when they're family members? What happens when they are cousins? Or when their moms, you know, are stepsisters and now somebody in the family is getting married. They want to go to a wedding and you're kicking the door of the wedding in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, there's all kinds of problems with the civil gang injunctions. It's a good idea. It's just not very practical. And uh, in some senses, it may not be fair. So very interesting. Um, let's see here. Effectiveness of civil gang injunctions. Uh, I, I would imagine that they're successful, but again, it's, it's not whether or not they're successful or effective. It's more about whether or not uh, they're reasonable, I suppose. Um, they go a little beyond gang suppression, which is kind of neat here. They talk about group violence intervention. These are just uh, the functional family therapy program. These are all things that are kind of extra. Um, and it can actually work for both gang and youth uh, peer stuff, you know, peer uh, at risk peers uh, groups. Gang resistance training, project, great. 
Oh, there they have it there too. They stole my thunder. Great. Um, this has actually been around for quite a while. It's a middle school program. And we're starting to introduce it into elementary schools. Um, we typically didn't, but this has some promise to it. It does. It, it's a little, there's a little more to it than what, what they suggest, but I'm not going to get too deep into that. The idea is it's a, it's a national or excuse me, a federal program that uh, is funded and is intended to prevent people from joining gangs in the first place, participating in gangs in the first place. Um, <clears throat> and again, at the very end of the day, addressing uh, community conditions. So maybe if we didn't have a bunch of vacant buildings for kids to hang out in and do what kids normally do, um, there wouldn't be the formation of gangs like that. So you start looking at some of these causal factors and attacking them. It's a fascinating section. It's a small section. Read it. And uh, I, I think it's interesting. So with that being said, everybody, you, you can read the conclusion. We wrapped it up. We're just under an hour. So I hope I didn't keep it too, too long. Um, and I hope you got something out of that. I hope that clears anything up. Remember, if you read this and you have questions, reach out to me. I have no problem going over certain things. I have no problem even shooting you an email and just explaining some stuff to you. But, uh, but yeah, definitely use me while I'm here. And uh, if you have a question about something, yeah, reach out. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. Thank you so much again. It's been a great semester. Um, I look forward to teaching you guys in the future. And I wish you the best of luck, uh, not only here at BG, but uh, in your professional future as well. Hope you guys get the jobs that you want. Hope you do the things that you want to do with these degrees that you're earning. And uh, man, hopefully someday I can come work for you. So anyway, have a great day. Have a great week. Have a great rest of your summer. And uh, best of luck to you all. Thanks again. Take care.